What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Don't Quit Your Day Job. You know me. I am your host, Maxim Allen. Today is October 10th, 2021. It's a rainy day in Brooklyn. Kind of nice. Finally getting into fall here. Um, I had a bit of a snafu lining up a guest this week, and I, uh, my last-minute guest is, who is joining us is a fantastic comedian, but he is a little sick, so we're doing a remote recording. It's a little different, but it'll be great. So everyone, please give it up right now for uh, Boston-turned-New York City comedian Jeff Medoff. Hey, thanks, Maxim. Thanks for having <laughs> me. I am sick, so I appreciate doing this. I, I, I don't think it's the Rona but <laughs> that's good i don't know yeah i i realized i was gonna say it's not the rona but i have no i haven't gotten tested so i don't know. i was like what am i basing that off of mother's intuition i can't guess why i feel like it's just a common thing people have been doing they're like i don't think it's coronavirus and you're like well you still need to go get yeah. tested i think it was really funny uh during like peak lockdown how just no one got like a regular cold because everyone was wearing masks and sanitizing it was like wow it's almost like we we make each other sick all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, so my, it's funny. My mom is, uh, she's a pediatrician and she works in, well, she's, she works in a pediatrician's office. She's not mm. like a full blown pediatrician. And, um, in fact, she's in administration. She's not even remotely close to healthcare, uh, professional whatsoever, but she works in a pediatrics office. <laughs> and she was saying last year they had like, there was nothing like they had nothing in their offices. And then this year it's been worse than ever. Because the kids weren't exposed to each other for like a whole year. They weren't getting like germ resistance. So oh. now they, they're, they've been, that soup has been like mixed back in and all their germs are like even worse than ever because they don't have like, they missed a year of developing an immune system. So they're all so much worse. Like it's been crazy for them. That is so wild. And I've never heard anyone talk about that. Like how crucial like the elementary school years are for just being sick and being around other kids and like... Right? Wow, that's so interesting. Right? Like, it's not, you wouldn't think it. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, she's like, they're strong, the nurses are strung out. And it's not as much of a COVID thing as you'd think, as much as like kids are just like petri dishes, pretty much of germs. Wow. So, okay. So we're going to end the podcast right here. Will you get your mom on? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll call her up. She's probably watching Tom Brady and the Pats right now. Oh, nice. So, are you? Oh, no. Are, Sorry. Are you a Patriots fan? I am. Mm. Tom Brady. They played last week. It's not this week. It's I'm a I'm like I'm a fan, and now I don't even know their schedule. <laughs> I am because I'm from New England, so it's like you always have to know. I am a pretty big football fan, but if you're from New England, you always have to know New England sports, like sort of like you just have to know a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, in like world news, you know. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, my family's big New England people. Yeah, see, uh, I'm from a part of the country where everyone can rally around the fact that we all hate the Patriots across <laughs> several states. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I get it. At, now that Brady's not on the Patriots, I hear how much people talk about him, and I get it now. I'm yeah. like, oh, this is excessive. His name's in, like, every other football commercial now. I, I do yeah. get it a little bit. So It's I, insane. And also... Sorry, what? what's your what's your team, Maxim? The the Broncos? Yeah, so I'm not like a I'm like a bandwagon fan. I like I I watched um two seasons of football in my life like really thoroughly, and those were the season before the Broncos won the Super Bowl, and then the se season they actually won the Super Bowl, and that was like it. But it's just it's just one of those things, you know. Oh, yeah, that's true. You did see them win one in your life. I forgot about yeah, that. Which that's was good. crazy. And it was like I went to class the day they had the victory parade in the in like downtown Denver. Mm. And downtown Denver is not made for two million people to be on the streets of the downtown at one time. It was right. it was nuts, but it was cool. Sounds fun. And you got to experience that like a hundred times in <laughs> the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. One of my, I was like nine and I went to a, a Super Bowl rally uh, with my dad at Government Center in Boston. And uh, I remember like it was so crowded and it was taking forever. So I just sat on his feet. I brought a book and I sat on his feet and just was reading a book. And I couldn't see, I like, it was hard for me to, to have enough light to read. There were so many people. It was like being in like, like a Lord of the Rings forest where you can't see shit. It was crazy. And then wow. he like lifted me on his shoulders when they actually came out and nice. did the speeches and stuff. It was dope. It was That's a good cool. time. You know, I really wish, uh, 
I, I've never felt this in my life before, but I really wish I was from Philly only for the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Because <laughs> that was, I was like, this is majestic. Yeah, you've <laughs> always wanted to go to war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, dude, the chaos, like the Broncos fans just like chilled. Like they were just drinking weed and, dr- sorry, drinking and smoking weed in the streets and like, woo. But Philly, I'm like, yeah, they're lighting stuff on fire. That's sick. Yeah, dude, they make Boston fans sort of go like, all right, you got work in the morning, man. Calm down. <laughs> they're they're nuts. They're intense there. All right, so this is actually a, a football podcast now. <laughs> um, we don't talk about people's creative passions I know, my bad. at all. <laughs> you, you, Maxim, you caught me at a good time for Don't Quit Your Day Job because I just binged Squid Game yesterday, and so I'm all like, fuck the economy right now. So this is like <laughs> the perfect time for me to be on. Dude, okay, yeah, no Squid Game spoilers, but like all right. it was amazing. I, I loved it. I was so in for the ride, and mm. the ending made me want to punch a wall. Yeah, it's cool. It was cool. I didn't, I didn't, a couple of good twists and turns and, uh, mm. you know, I, not giving too much away, but it is funny. I was thinking about how weird it is. Cause I do feel like there's been a lot of, uh, like popular, uh, like media that's kind of, it's so class based. Mm. And I do think it's kind of weird how like we watch a, something like squid game and we're like, Oh, that's us. You get how that's, <laughs> isn't that cute that that's us killing each other for money? Not spoil, no spoilers. Like, it, yeah. it's it, it's weird because i'm watching it and i'm like oh it's great and the allegory is so good but at the same time i'm like it's a little fucked up that they're just like oh here you go rabble isn't this like it's you put it out there and it's hard to not get into it without spoilers but i and feel like i felt the, the same way about parasite too a little yeah bit. absolutely and i mean the end this is like some, uh, something that hap- that is said in the last episode, but I think really resonated when he's like what do a rich man and a poor man have in common it's like mm. neither one is satisfied and it's yeah. like the idea that it's like you're being like goaded along by this huge pile of money and the people that supply the money are like, this is worthless. This doesn't make us happy. What makes us happy is like you suffering. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's, yeah. So I was like, maybe I don't need to be rich. Maybe I just need to be <laughs> fucking cool. Yeah. You just you just need to get your uh, your marbles game on point. That's all you need to do. <laughs> awesome. Well. Okay, we're going to get into it now. So, Jeff, you are a comedian. I am. You uh, are in a special situation. Uh, I don't think I've actually met anyone. I, actually, I, in real life, I think I've met one other group of people that's like this. But you and your brother are both comedians. Yeah, yes, that's right. He's out in Chicago. We both started in Boston. He started in college. He's a little bit younger than me, but he technically started before me. Mm-hmm. Um in Boston. Uh, but he was at Emerson college. And so I got into comedy like right after I graduated. Yeah. And I was like living it like right in, in Boston. Mm-hmm. And so he was going to like his college stuff, but I was going to sort of the more like actual Boston scene. Cause they're a little mm-hmm. bit separate. Like if yeah. any art scene, you know, there's like sort of like a college mediated version of it. And then there's like the actual like local scene of it and nary the twain shall meet. Um, so so he started before you, but you were like, yeah, but I'm doing real open mics. <laughs> yeah, but well, I'm really sad doing this. <laughs> I didn't say it with my words. I did say it with my eyes when we talked about it. No, he <laughs> he, eventually, he he came out before too long. But yeah, so people uh, in Boston knew me first. Mm-hmm. Some people knew him first, but most knew me first. And then when he came along, it became a whole thing of we both needed to just get good enough that people had a reason to actually remember there was two of us. <laughs> because for the first like year of my stand up career, I got brought up to my brother's name so much. Oh, and yeah. It was like, you know, he, you, you're you're like new and you don't want to correct people. But you're like, I am like a legit different person. I know you see like a million white guys that look like me a day. <laughs> but like, I am literally a different person. Yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, the names Joe and Jeff I know. would probably get passed over. But then last name Medoff is like, that's something that people would remember. So it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, he's Jeff Medoff. No, he's Joe Medoff. Like, yeah, no, 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 that's one guy, right? <laughs> exactly. Pretty much. Everyone remembers, remembers Jay and then almost Bernie Madoff. That's yeah. what they that's like <laughs> how it sticks in people's brains. But now it's like he's in Chicago and I'm <laughs> in New York. And we've been also just been doing it long enough that people know it. But right. Yeah, it, it was it was a struggle in the very beginning, for sure. So for both of you to get into it, were you, was your family into comedy like when you were younger? Um, so that's a good question. So I don't think they kind of, I mean, we watched like, 
My family was a big movie family. Like we would rent a lot of movies from Blockbuster, and I remember we like our one of our like the best genres were like most of the shit we rented. I think in hindsight was like the SNL alum of the time movies. So like all the Adam Sandler movies, of course, the David Spade movies, even the ones that like people think sucked. We loved them. Like mm-hmm. the ch- Dicky one, the one when he's the childhood star. Oh, we the like, ball- what is it, the Ballad of? Dickie Robinson or something like that? Yeah, Dickie Robinson or something like that. That one we loved. We we even watched the Chris Rock movies, which, like, Mm -hmm. people, like, forget that those even exist. Like, Head of State was (laughs) huge in my household. And, but so, in terms of, like, actual comedy, Mm -hmm. we didn't really have a ton of it. I I don't know. The only time I've remembered comedy with my family was my aunt describing to me jokes from Eddie Murphy. That was, like, the Eddie Murphy Mm. Delirious or Raw or one of them. And uh, and she's telling me, and it sounds funny, but it never really stuck in my... But right. it's funny because I did have, like, very early love of comedy. Like, mm-hmm. I remember being... You know when you were in high school, or no, not even even younger than that, like, elementary school, and you write, like, what's your favorite, like, food, or what do you want to be when you grow up, like... Yeah. And they put it in a yearbook. I, I remember in one of those writing comedian. Mm-hmm. And then for years, not even thinking about it, not even really thinking about comedy... Well, and then, and then, except for like Dane Cook and you know YouTube stuff, and then I, at like fourteen or fifteen, I was in again a blockbuster. Most of my life, just I guess, is thanks to blockbuster. And I found this like five dollar uh, DVD bin, and there was like a Dave Chappelle special in it. And I don't know mm-hmm. how I knew, but I was like, five. This seems like a steal. Like I was into Chappelle's show, and I was like, five dollars seems like it. I have five dollars. Like I'm, and I'm fourteen. Like I feel like, yeah. So I bought it and I, I, that was just sort of it. And then like, I'd never heard someone talk like his Sesame Street mm-hmm. bits and stuff like the very early Chappelle. Um, and you were like, wow, people are going to be really mad about this in 10 years. Yeah, I know. No, <laughs> <laughs> I was like in 15 years, he's going to be canceled for a movement. I don't even know exists yet. <laughs> <laughs> so no. you, you buy that independently and that's kind of your first foray into like really consuming stand up comedy. It's mine. Yeah, for sure. And then, uh, you know, a little bit like from high school into college, I was big into it. I would watch it on YouTube all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, George Carlin, uh, a, a lot of like, you know, the Bill Burrs and a lot of the like the greats, but never like, I just loved hearing comedians talk. Mm-hmm. And so, like even like I would even look up, this was like pre, you know, podcasts and pre like the internet, like listening, being as sophisticated as it was. So like I would find like old school George Carlin or whoever, like John Stewart, interviews of them because I always they were just always interesting even on like right. news programs so I like I got into that stuff and so it was just everything about comedians and late night shit I also mm-hmm. talk show stuff and after college when I was you know I, I was a creative writer in college like okay. among, among other things like mm-hmm. and so when I graduated I like was sort of just keeping a notepad and I didn't really I was just scribbling thoughts and stuff Mm -hmm. And I distinctly remember one day at my day job, um, I was just popping around on YouTube. It was one of those, you know, putting on something to listen to while I do like the Excel sheet or whatever. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, I think it was Mark Maron. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, they just start talking, some comics, they were Boston comics and they're talking about like where they got started. And I'm like, cause I'm in Boston at the time. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's right down the street. Like literally the place Patrice O'Neill first did comedy. I worked like 800 feet away from Mm -hmm. it. And it wasn't, they didn't have comedy there anymore, but I was like, wow, that's crazy. They just started. And I, I realized I was like one day on the train looking at my like little notepad and I was like, this kind of sounds like stand up comedy. Like mm-hmm. this seems like jokes and I never realized that. And eventually I met a dude um, named, he's like, he's really involved in the Boston scene. His name is Rob Crane. I met him at this uh, creative writers workshop in JP, which I went to because I thought for creative writing purposes. And he did a story and I asked him mm-hmm. afterwards, Hey, was that stand up? And he was like, it was, I, I'm a comedian. And then he's like, I do in Boston. And he told me where to go. And then it was it. Then I just Whoa. went and then it was that. So, so a, a, like parallel to this, you mentioned that your brother Joe started before you. So did that, did him, did he tell you he started doing stand up at all? Like when he was at oh, college? Yeah. He, he was into stand up in like high school and he, he was like a creative dude mm. uh, back then. It just, it never factored into me. Like, I was just like, ah, oh, that's just something Joe's doing. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like your your little brother. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, he's getting, and he was, you know, he was he was doing it and he went to school for it. So he got kind of keyed into it at like an earlier stage of life than me. 
Um, mm. He was once like, again, hang up the call, get Joe on the line. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll interview Honestly, all your family members except for you. <laughs> you might as well, dude. I'm just like kind of run off from all the interesting shit they do. I'll just compile that. Uh, so what was your uh, what was your first open mic? Oh, what, what, so, did you have a moment that like pushed you like now is the time to get out there and try this? No. Well, so this is so to just to circle back, I like wrote <clears throat> probably for like six months before I actually tried it mm-hmm. because it was like a weird little like thing in my brain where I was enjoying writing and like I, I just didn't eventually have like any type of impetus to do it. But I remember one day there was like just something personal eventually clicks in you. And I said, actually said to Joe, Joe, can you bring me to some open mics? And he Mm -hmm. was like, sure. And I went to this one in downtown Boston at this place called The Hideout, which that's like a a very popular show in Boston. Now this is, there was an original location where they also, they started as an open mic. It was like this, uh, it looked like a fucking uh, basement where like the, like the forefather, the revolutionary fathers used to like rant about like British taxes. It was like (laughs) that type of crusty. Yeah. And, uh, we went and everyone bombed. I thought it was the craziest, the best thing I'd ever seen. And then one guy gets on and he's kind of bombing. And then he just like lays into everyone. He just like completely explodes and like like saying like fuck you know fuck this and fuck you guys you're not fucking pay-. like all the stuff that we think at open mics but nobody actually says he just like yeah. <laughs> and every all the other comics like just give him a standing ovation and i was like <laughs> i have no idea what the fuck is going on here but like th- something's going on and i want to get involved and a couple months later or so i i just found the first i went again with joe to my first open mic it's this open mic that used to be in boston called grandma's basement mm-hmm which was like a real popular, this was like the, one of the last ones. I got into the Boston scene in a weird transition phase kind of, but I went to the last one one time and I went on, uh, I think I was supposed to do five minutes. I could only remember like two and a half of it and it went decently and -hmm. I got off and I remember the host saying like, is this your first time? And he was like, well, welcome to the life. Yeah. And that just sort of like reverberated in my brain. And then I, I just went from there. So your first open mic, you went with Joe. Did he go up before or after you? I uh, I don't remember. I was so nervous. I couldn't like mm. I I just remember like the the structure of the room. I don't even gotcha. remember kind of the I do remember the jokes I told, I think. But they're yeah. they're terrible and I won't don't ask me. I can't <laughs> okay. I can't say them. Um did, so did uh how experienced was Joe at this point compared to you? Was he like a year in or something or Um Yeah, I think he he was still mainly at um emerson stuff okay. i think and he would have been in like senior no junior or sophomore year of college so he would have been doing it for a couple years um mm-hmm. i don't know exactly when he would say he started doing comedy but right right he, he he'd been doing it long enough where like he knew of people in the scene like i showed up right. and thought everyone was legit and he knew like oh that guy does this show and that guy is at this club and so he right. knew enough that's um, kind of helpful you have like a nice little ease into like what the comedy scene is like yeah it did. It was good to start. And then, well, so after I'd done two or three, I completely abandoned him and just went by myself the whole time. Yeah. Not abandoned him, but you know what I mean. I was like, yeah. all right, I can take it from here. And then I just went all the time. Mm-hmm. So how long were you in Boston doing uh, stand-up? So I started in 2015. Whoa. Um, I didn't realize you have <laughs> been doing it that long. <laughs> yeah. I had started in 2015. That was like when I first started going every week. Um mm-hmm. And I was in Boston the whole time. I was in New England. I mean, the good thing about being there is you can access all of New England. Like, right. Which it's out when you describe like you're like, oh, what's the difference between fucking Maine and Vermont? But there actually is kind of a nice difference crowd wise where you can mm-hmm. get different types of crowds. But uh, yeah, I was there. Um, yeah, I guess for five years. I mean, I was there up until coronavirus. I, I was doing it that whole time until. 20 yeah so march of 20 so i was doing it five years when coronavirus hit and there was really nothing to do in boston at all through the whole right. coronavirus like the whole time we didn't have because we are not like a city that has outdoor spaces like new york and some places are boston's very uh indoors because it's a winter town pretty much and then like a summer town so you're either you want to be outside or inside that's it there's no right. like half on a on a roof with like heating lamps and shit there's probably stuff like that now but there wasn't that so there were no outdoor shows. There were like maybe two outdoor open mics and they went in and out and like a coronavirus outbreak always just canceled them. And people were like, no. Right. So I <laughs> wanted to move to New York anyway. And so I wound up coming here uh, this April. 
Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and yeah. That's yeah. When, yeah. You were you're you were early on the wave of all the Boston comics coming here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. There's always like a little pilgrimage from Boston because people like get just a big eyed and want to come here because mm. it's only four hours away. I uh, I tweeted the other day. I was like, New York City has more Boston comics than Boston does. <laughs> that's that's starting to be true, honestly. <laughs> Dude, that's honestly starting to be true. It's like, uh, who was it? Uh, just last week, I met Sean Duffy, who just yeah. moved here, who's also another Boston comic. It's just like... <laughs> oh, yeah. I know Sean well, yeah. He doesn't stop. No, so, there'll be more. <laughs> there will be more just max and just be prepared to meet many more they're gonna they're gonna be landing on the shores in like those uh d-day boats exactly exactly <laughs> like that yeah so wow i didn't realize you've been doing it for five years so when uh mm-hmm. when did how long had you been doing it before you got on your first show in boston oh yeah um probably about a year okay i think it was a year because i wasn't like i was pretty ner- like shy when i first started i thought everyone was like so legit Mm-hmm. and um i was like the only person who didn't know what the fuck he was doing which obviously yeah. turned out to not everyone thought that but for the i probably didn't talk to other comics for the first four or five months i just showed up at open mics and like was shyly in the back of the room and did my mm-hmm. time and left uh and then eventually you know you talk to one or two people and things snowball i did my first show uh, about a year into stand up it was in alston massachusetts it was this show called the bad bad show um run by my friend Brandon Valley and he was like hey man come do stand up you definitely are ready to do and i had he like paid me and i brought mm-hmm. friends and i was like wow i never i actually this is corny but i actually still have like the uh the first the dollar like the first dollar i ever made doing stand up <laughs> i still have it yeah. somewhere unless that's i think it's a common experience <laughs> yeah it, was, it felt so good yeah. and then i got another show that an, another friend was like hey man you're ready to do this shit come and then i did his show and um then you i kept like kind of going and then you eventually like ask a club to do a spot so Mm -hmm. it did take me a little while that's great though i feel like it a year is a long time to wait but also like that's so validating too so did your first show go well did you have a good set i think it went pretty good i did like nine or ten minutes i think Mm -hmm. uh i have it on record it's like it's not good yeah but i got laughs so that's all i didn't bomb uh, my stage presence is fucking awful, but um, <laughs> it was it was good. It was fun. And then like me and my friends went out afterwards, and they were like, "You were good." And I was like, "Ah," and they were like, "No, really." And nice. so that was that was fun. It was a good experience. And I remember like, uh, but some of the comics on a crush. I forget who closed, but I remember someone on it just like leveled at the end, and I was like, "Oh man, like that's like." a real deal thing right there where i'm Mm -hmm. like this is good that i'm here now but like there's also this to consider where i gotta right just keep going and it was good damn that's sick i i remember so my not my first show my first show i didn't perform in front of any friends it was like way away from the city but my second show was on i did 10 minutes and Mm -hmm. i I brought like all of my friends wanted to come my family wanted to come and then like a few co-workers came and i actually did pretty well and it was funny because afterward all my coworkers were like, you're better than I thought you would be. <laughs> <laughs> that is, for some reason, that is such a, like, valid, for as shitty as that is to say, that compliment is so validating. Mm-hmm. Because they're, they're acknowledging, like, I was prepared to be nice to you about yeah. this. And I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be, like, straight up, like, I'm surprised at how good you are. That That yeah. always feels, I like that more than, like, yeah, you were great. It's like, I didn't expect you to be that good. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You fucking didn't. <laughs> i think yeah it's just like when people in your personal life know you do stand up there's so much doubt around it I, yeah. th- I think most people don't they're only exposed to like netflix specials or like touring comics at a comedy club and they're like oh that person who went to my high school or whatever like there's no way he's oh, any totally. good at this you know yeah and people come to this stuff sometimes and it sucks you know like that, yeah like um they don't always know what you, they mean when you say come to my stand up show. Sometimes people think it's like improv or like sketch. Yeah. Like, no, stand up's just straight up. A lot of, I, you know, this is something I kind of had too when I started was like, like you don't know that stand up is such a live performance art form when you get into it because mm-hmm. like all the stand up, uh, some people I'm, maybe do, but like I started like, you know, the biggest specials in the world were my frame of reference for comedy. So yeah. like, 
getting the live portion of it, it's, it's like relearning what you think the art even is, you know, it's like totally, it's not like the regular, unless you're famous is not the Wilbur every night or Beacon Theater every night. It's like, you know, a pub with a hundred and some odd people at best, if you're a pro comic, which is still yeah. super fun, you know? Right. So people's, ca- people's expectations are definitely like, uh, interesting to gauge when they first come there you're like hey come to this coffee shop comedy and they're like huh and then there's like 40 people and they're like i was actually sweet i didn't think that like i could buy a fucking danish and have a good comedy show but it turns out it is yeah it's it's yeah to- i think also uh as a comedian who has done some shows that uh objectively sucked and <laughs> has produced shows that objectively sucked i get it like they're it's like audience members coming to an uh, just some random comedy show it's yeah. a full dice roll like if the comedy show is bad and those people are just there on a whim they're never going to see comedy again mm. if they're like true comedy fans they might be like okay that one was bad but they're not all that way right but yeah. i don't feel like they're as forgiving as i'd like to believe <laughs> they, they might not be the, people have like a certain threshold mm-hmm. of, of how many times they'll try something most yeah. people say they're comedy fans and really they like like uh they like like Ronnie Chang and that's you know what I mean they like like four people which is fine right. it's fine it's like it's like music most people say they're music fans but really they they they're like oh I like like six bands yeah i mean it, it makes sense especially with like how comedy is like fed to us i feel like like most people who are non comedians who find out I'm a comedian and they're like, Oh, I love comedy. I'm a huge comedy fan. It's Mm -hmm. always the big ones. It's like Joe Rogan, Dave Chappelle. Like if someone actually says, Oh, I'm a huge comedy fan. I love people like Maria Bamford or Tignataro. Then I'm like, Whoa. Okay. So you actually know, like you you, actually like comedians. You've done research. Yeah. Yeah. If someone ever knows a name, like if someone's ever like, Oh, I love Stephen Wright. You're just like, Holy crap. That's amazing that you know who that is. And yeah. You don't do comedy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, I, I, yeah. And like, also, you probably experienced this is everyone you brought to the first show maybe came to one more later, but for the most part, they don't come back. Uh, yeah, it gets a lot harder to convince them. Yeah, for sure. And then they, <laughs> because they say they want to always come, but there's like just the thing that, that mm-hmm. comes up. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people, they saw me actually. One of the last shows I did before pandemic, I had some friends who hadn't seen me in a while. And one of them, she was like, you've gotten so much better since the last time I saw you. And I was like, when's the last time you saw me? It was like two years before that or something. (laughs) I was like, well, you know, that's a long time. Yeah. I mean, that's that's insane. I I don't think I also don't think people expect comedians to grow. Mm -hmm. Like when you invite people to one of your first shows, they think that's as good as you're going to be forever right yeah. and they're like okay yeah i saw him he was good i can go home now it's like but no there's like new jokes and there's like improved skill and oh mm-hmm. maybe this one i figured out crowd work you know yeah even just like i'm more confident now because mm-hmm. so much of it is like people respond to to like the confidence so much of just yeah. being on stage not like yelling and all that but just like being in your pocket mm-hmm. you know you've like you've carved out your pocket a little more like the more you do it I mean, that's, that's why I feel like, I mean, that's why I like listening to your shows because I like hearing a lot of times I feel like people go on here and talk about like how they carved out their pocket to yeah. stand up a little bit. Interesting. I don't like, know why I keep pronouncing it pocket like that specifically, but I'll stop. <laughs> so what, what do you, what, what do you mean by that? Like, <laughs> do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I feel like, I don't know. I think that it, I, I think with comedy, with stand up, I guess this is with everything. People mm-hmm. don't like. You know, you you try everything. I I think it like Jerry Seinfeld, and I hate like doing the oh this is what like a famous comic said about com- comedy. But I remember Jerry Seinfeld being like, you know, you you should talk about your comedy career like it's a child. Like when you when it's one year old, that's like it's like as advanced as a one year old when it's a five year old. And so like the more time you spend, it's almost like the more time like a, a kid spends in school or just like a human being spends in the world. Like you just you just get better at doing stuff by doing it. And yeah. it's like, but it's not like a conscious, I'm, it's kind of a weird, not to get too spiritual or whatever, but it's sort of like an old Zen tenant where people are mm-hmm. like, it's something that occurs, like it's the effort of not trying or something like that, where it's like, 
you get better at doing something and putting effort into something in the extent that you just repeated it so much, you can do it without the effort. It's like you don't have to think about how you breathe because you right. breathe so much. Yeah. And so comedy, I think, is like you don't have to – like the more you do it, the more it becomes like breathing. That's why people who've been doing it for 30 years, you watch them and like – you're like he had didn't tell a single joke and he just tore it up. How does that? How is that mm-hmm. possible? Because yeah. they ha- they can breathe, they can speak a language, kind of. So totally, I think that's, that's a great way to put it. I I always think about like like the long game of like stand up, right? It's like mm-hmm. I think like a lot a lot of times we get caught up in the moment of like what am I getting booked on this month or what am I doing this week or how am I doing compared to other people when it's really like. In five years, it's going to blow your mind how much better you're going to be at this. Yeah. Like, you're not going to be thinking about the things you thought about this month. Like, mm-hmm. it just kind of all washes away, you know? Totally. And just kind of like, it's such a, in your way, it's such a passively getting better type thing because you just mm-hmm. do it, you do it a bunch, you do it a bunch, you do it a bunch. And I think in the beginning, there are some like active things you can change. You know, you watch a tape and you're like, oh, I got to change my body language or I got to change how I do these little fine-tuned mm-hmm. things but once you're like a year and a half in everything from there just feels like passive growth just being yeah. added on yeah i think that uh, the, uh, my first year in it was a lot of uh li- just not having any clue what i'm doing i'm a big just learner by doing anyway mm-hmm. so like I, that first year th- i don't know if i i don't think i got much better in that first year to be honest with you maxim but i think i got like much more comfortable and i grew a lot from yeah from second it was like just sort of putting a bed it's almost like um like uh resoiling a garden you know like yeah. i had to put the right soil in before anything could actually grow right yeah that's a great way of looking at it i like in hindsight my first year i feel like was like uh, a lot of improvement just in the joke front mm-hmm. but it was all like it was all just lottery like i just kept trying to think of new jokes and eventually i got like like you know 10 yeah. minutes that were like good for how i was that time and i was like mm. this is all luck <laughs> yeah <laughs> i still kind of honestly that's that's a great way to think of it is like the lottery mm-hmm. i still kind of think like i might that might be my my main thing sometimes it's just like the rolodex of is this funny but actually that's kind of <clears throat> sorry the Ron is acting up <clears throat> that's why i'm kind of glad that i one of the reasons i came here is because you know, people are so like obsessed and like well uh, disciplined in terms of trying to to like find an artistic structure with comedy. Like right. they're so joke like writing focused. Like so many people are like just so good punch 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 punch. Like shorten write l- write stuff, and it's a good way to be. Not that people aren't like that in Boston, but I think that here it's it's to a. Uh, um, like an nth level and so part of the reason i came here was to try and become a more uh more purposeful writer in Mm. a way which i which hopefully will happen over time interesting so So. this is this is something i wanted to get into as well is your analysis of what boston comedy is like versus new york city comedy like on the last episode of this podcast i had uh eli ruffer on and we taught like I know listeners. Okay, I've been in like a comedian hot streak. All right, it's been t- 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 like comedians. When you ask them to do a podcast, they're like, yes, happily. Right. When you when you ask an artist or a musician or someone else, they're like, oh, yeah, 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 sure, I'll do it. And then they bail. And, the much uh, yeah. more interesting people never want to do it. It's always yeah. the people who are like. Oh, I fucking watch Squid Games. Um, it's like you don't, you don't. They're like, oh, how many people actually are going to listen to this podcast that I've been invited to? I'm like, you don't understand. Well, you my should fire that back with, of comedians. You should fire that back with how many people listen to your music. Let's be yeah. honest. <laughs> Come on the podcast, maybe two more listen. Um, right, but yeah. So uh, one thing that Eli mentioned though is he mentioned he talked about coming from Minneapolis to like Chicago and then New York City, and. Yeah in like a smaller scene right your open mics there are real audiences that attend and watch and so your your open mics feel more like shows where you're doing the same jokes you're doing a material and then you're maybe experimenting with something in the middle and the pressure is kind of on to impress because it's like a smaller community then you come to a like new york city and i can't speak for other larger cities but you pretty much go to a mic 
you do a couple of times of like doing impress jokes and then after that it doesn't matter if you shit the bed because there's no audience you're just right. experimenting right so how does boston stack up against new york city i think it's actually almost exactly the same on the open mic level no, mm. there's no there's no open mic crowds in boston not the ones i used okay. to go to if there are crowds sometimes you luck out and like you know tourists walk in and they watch um <clears throat> or like friends come they're they're uh, there was not any open mics where you'd go, all right, they always get a good crowd. And if you want to get this, so w the big difference between New York and Boston is, um, you know, in New York, there's a million shows and open mics every right. night, every night. And in Boston, there's a lot of shows. But if you have an open mic on like a Tuesday, everyone who's not on a show is there. There's right. like, like we used to have open mics that would be like 30 to 40 people long. Mm -hmm. And would go, there were no caps. They would go from start to finish. And it was so, like, it, they were all marathons. When I came here and saw the thing of, like, oh, only 15 people. And then there's four other mics you can go to if you don't get on those. I was shocked. I was like, man, this is kind of <laughs> nice. Yeah, I don't have to wait for three hours if I show up, like, 15 minutes late because 18 other people signed up before me. Right. Um, the, the open mic scene... It's pretty varied. I mean, you know, you have better ones than others just because, like, there are certain venues that might get participants. But there's no, it's not, you've described that to me before, your, like, open mic, like, audience. That is yeah. not a thing in Boston. Okay. It, that is not a thing at all there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's because people, uh, you know, it, it is, it's, Boston's not a, an entertainment city. It's not in right. the way that New York is. But there is enough shit that people are doing. And people aren't like, uh, people are always like trying to watch a sports game or they're trying to go, they want to go home and like work on their, fu their fucking PhD or something. You know, it's mm. like, it's, it's a bit, <laughs> it's not an artistic town in the most like right. stringent, stringent sense. There's an art scene of all kinds and they're good, but they're not at the forefront of what you do there, you know? Gotcha. Okay. And uh, so you, part of your move to come to New York City is coronavirus like there was <laughs> nothing going on mm -hmm. in boston which i know I, I i might have said this in the podcast before but i remember uh peter Liu came out here he mm. and i i know him through david dobbins and i was on peter Liu's zoom show during the pandemic he came out came to some tiny cupboard mics and we hung out a little bit and then he went back to boston and I remember him posting, like, we got an open mic in a park, just like New York City. <laughs> and I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is, look, New York, it's it's hard to, New York's still the name brand for comedy, you know what I mean? It's still, right. yeah. <clears throat> this is this is the way everyone does it. And, um, yeah, I, I had wanted to move to New York before, my plan before coronavirus had been mm -hmm. to move uh, last September. I was like, oh, I've got it all lined up. I had all these shows lined up for, like, the summer i was getting on some good stuff i was gonna mm -hmm. just work on like my jokes for the summer with like as much stage time as i could and then i'd move here and try and hit the ground running and then obviously right. coronavirus just stopped that mm -hmm. so i did move because of corona but it was also i had wanted to come here anyway um stuff's back in boston now but yeah there was just nothing going on and i saw how much people here were just i didn't even know that many people i knew like david dobbins and chris kinback Mm -hmm. and i knew a few other people but um they were the ones that were like they told me when i messaged them they're like yeah stuff's back here and they told me about like what's going on and i was like all right well that sounds i'll go do a, a part i've been living with my mom for like nine months so <laughs> and doing no comedy doing zoom comedy so this sounds so much better than right than anything it's like a it's like a comedy gold rush from <laughs> Boston, New York. City. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there's there's stage time aplenty. You <laughs> dig an inch into the dirt and you found twenty minutes of stage time. <laughs> yeah, we were all singing the song from Five Will Goes West as we got on the train and we came down here <laughs> we about how we were all gonna find the golden open mic. <laughs> so how was uh? So you got here. You said in April, twenty twenty one. Yes. That's so how was how was your adjustment? How was coming to the to this comedy scene? Terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrifying. Um, but it was also because I mean I think it had to do as much with the the you know apo mini apocalypse that had been resolving as well. But the the scene is just you know it's funny because like the first few weeks were harrowing, and then it right. really became so much like 
because uh, the first few weeks you you showed up and I didn't know where to go. I messaged a couple people. David told me about his open mic at Tiny Cupboard, um, and a couple other people like, "Hey, come hang out. We're going here." But like, I didn't know the regular spots. I didn't know what was good. I looked up a few places and they were like closed. They weren't even venues anymore. Right. And so I was like, I'll just show up at something and hit the ground. I think two days being here, I I just immediately started going every night because mm-hmm. I was like, I don't want to have this like learning curve. And I don't want to be sitting in this like room in in B- Brooklyn, like not knowing where to be or go. So right. it, it, and it was you show up at, at all these mics um, and like yours, I came to and I was mm. like, God, all these legit. It was literally like it's funny. It was like starting over again. Like, oh, my God, all these legit New York comedians. <laughs> Holy crap. That's, you know. <laughs> Matt, dude, I was like you like you I was just like this must be just like the coolest dude who knows everybody which not that you're not that but like yeah I but was I'm like, just a regular guy a bunch amongst yeah. a bunch of other regular guy com- comedians exactly. it's just it's just it's the same everywhere so right. once that like the starry eyed which is still hard to not have because mm-hmm. like I'll be walking and like to go to something at the grizzly pair and Mark Norman will walk by me and that's still something I'm getting um, used to he's dead Oh, is that true? Oh, no. Norm MacDonald is dead. Sorry. <laughs> they all have the same name. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> Wait, Norm MacDonald died? I didn't see that on Twitter at all. <laughs> Holy shit. I always get them confused. Uh, Mark Marin, Marin Norm yeah. MacDonald, and the other one that you mentioned. Uh, uh, yeah, Mar- Mark Norman. Mark Norman. Yeah. It's just a lot of, you know, know. they're all the same guy. They're all dead. They're all <laughs> uh, they're all alive. <laughs> Maxim's he's going to hear this one day and be like Mark Norman is dead to me. <laughs> like, oh wow. But well, yeah, he really I really didn't like that last special. I totally get it. Like I think I definitely mentioned this I think last episode, but uh one of the first New York City shows I I went to to watch, that was like an indie show. Todd Berry was the opener. Yeah. And I was like, what on earth is this place? Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, I totally get it when when you kind of start in a scene, you definitely always get that wide eye. Like it's like being starstruck. I think part of it is because when you're in a scene for a long time, you know everybody and you're not surprised by any of their material. Yeah. When you move scenes, it's all new people, all new material. So when you hear their jokes for the first time, it hits so hard and you're like, everyone uh-huh. is incredible. Yeah, you yeah, know? totally. <laughs> I, I honestly, yeah, I appreciated moving. One, because I got to see all sorts of new comics. And two, because, you know, not that like people didn't appreciate me in Boston, but comics here, they don't know the, the they don't remember the years of you not knowing what the hell you're doing at open mics. They're all just like, oh, this guy has capable, like this guy's a capable standup. And right. he's, got, he's got well thought, jokes that he's done a lot he's not you know you're not you're a new item to people and they're they respect the um the skill they don't have the it's like when you leave your hometown to go to college you know it's like oh these aren't the people that you grew up with like who remember you being five and crying on like the the uh baseball field which i didn't do by the way that was uh (laughs) that was mark (laughs) keller that wasn't me (laughs) um that part that dude doesn't exist i made that name up um (laughs) So it was, it was honestly, I, it was very intimidating at first, but what did shock me was how quickly it went from that to not intimidating. And it still right. is like, I mean, it still is, you meet someone with stature, it's, it's like, damn, this is dope as hell, but it, it's, it's good. I mean, the scene's pretty good and I get why people get so good here. There's just so much shit to do. Right. So. And it's, I feel like also you came at a great time, which mm-hmm. is like, like 2020 was amazing in New York City, but this year when everything kind of opened up a bit again, <laughs> I, I love the idea. It's not to interrupt you, but I love the idea of someone list like an aggregator, like taking just that clip of you saying <laughs> 2020 was amazing in New York City. I'll say it right now: best summer of my yeah. life so far. Best summer of my hey, life. You got to speak your truth, my man. Yeah, you exactly. Say it, my friend. And uh, but yeah, so this year though, when everything opened up, a lot of people in their the back of their minds were worried. Like you know, outdoor comedy was so fun and independent. Out like all these park mics and shows. It was such a good hang. It was just like chill vibes. Yeah. When everything opens up again, are we just going to go back to the way we were before, where we're all kind of cold and separated from each other, and the scene has a lot of competitions and facelessness? It's like, yeah, no, actually, everyone who was here during the pandemic and is doing stuff now just got friendlier like it just became like a more tight-knit community and scene Mm. 
where you go to open mics and every host will be friendly and introduce themselves to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so it's great. It's like the I think based on my six months pre Corona and my Corona time and put like quote unquote post Corona time. This is like really like a golden age of like, yeah, open miking. <laughs> I did want to ask you, okay, so you got here six months before Corona. June, June, July, July, 2019. Okay. Yeah. So you had a good amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I think that people are just so happy the world's back. I think that it's hard to take, yeah. take stuff for granted. Eat like I, the times, I, cause I left. Uh, I didn't get to see anyone when I when I left Boston, and when I went back, like you see, like the most random people, and you like you're moved. You're so moved to see, like, dude, remember we did two shows together and like never spoke. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, <laughs> those vibes are good. It it feels welcoming, but people are still like. Also, this comedy standard is pretty pretty high. Like, yeah. people will give you compliments, but also like you're still bombing if if stuff's not good, which is still mm -hmm. still nice. Unless yeah. the mic just sucks, which is, of course, classic. Yeah, it's good. Maxim, it's like a weird environment. It's like once you learn how to operate the environment, it's just learning the what the new subway stops to go to. That's yeah, I feel like totally. I feel like that's how it goes. I, f I feel like I wasn't I wasn't from my home t like scene in like Boulder, Colorado. I was not prepared mm. for a scene of this scope and scale. But now that I'm here in New York City, I'm like, I could figure it out anywhere. I could make it work. I, I have a question for you, actually. So, yeah. like, let's say, I don't know much. I've never been to, I know uh, a couple of comics from Denver, but they kind of left pretty quick. So I don't think they got a good sense. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is something I'm kind of trying to figure out with myself now. What are the, um, like, what are the goals of comics who stay in Denver? Do you know what I mean? Like, are there goals or is it sort of just you get good at stand up and then you eventually get road work just by and by? Or are there like people you're trying to be? There's I think like the goal for for many people who are like starting comedy to like five years in, the goal is to get on comedy works. And they also have the comedy <laughs> fort, which just opened in Fort Collins. But those are like mm. like comedy works when I was there was the the only club that you wanted to be on, right? So you would do like new talent night there. If you were like I forgot how people got this, but also new faces night. Like new talent night was like you call every week and you leave yeah. your name on a voicemail and after ten weeks you get a two and a half minute set and then they give you critical feedback in your tape and all that. Okay. And uh then new new faces is like a competition where everyone gets like five or seven. I don't know. I, I never got into that one, but you want to, it's almost like you want to be in that club system for their house shows. Yeah. And that, cause that's where people congregate for comedy on top of that. There's also, I had I don't think I've ever seen a local comedian do this one in my time there, but the Boulder comedy show, I've mentioned this so many times in the podcast, but at Bohemian beer garden in Boulder, it's like all road comics. It's Sundays, 7 and 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. And they just bring people who are just straight murderers on That's stage. Cool. And it's a, it's like a German beer hall. So everyone's sitting at these big benches with pretzels and these huge steins of beer. Mm -hmm. And it's just like such an amazing crowd. And that's like a that is like a, a goal and like a show for people all over. But I think a lot of comedians in Colorado, it's like you want to be a, a comedy works comedian or a club comic there. And also, a lot of the comics would also go to festivals, like very much go somewhere else for comedy, right? Like, right. I feel like being in New York City, I don't have as much of an urge to apply to festivals because comedy is happening around me constantly, right? Yeah. But I, and like, I don't know. So it's like a, it's like a different thing, but there are people who do a lot of, a lot of comedy work out there and do like paid gigs or produce shows and all sorts of weird places like but i don't know i never really got like my time there my first year i was just like just like pure dog shit open micer so i never got to the oh i need to think like what do i think about the grander scope of this right like it was mm. just like for me it was like I just need to get on a show. Yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all at the beginning. You're just like, that's just, it's like uh, one minded. You're just like, I'm going to get better stage time and then figure it out from there. Right. 
Yeah. And then I moved to New York City and I moved here because I wanted to like see the top of the food chain is what I told yeah. myself. I wanted to see just how high the ladder goes and like what is serious comedy. And the ladder uh-huh. goes pretty high, but also the ladder is shorter than I would have thought, you know? Like yeah. seeing people get new opportunities at like various shows like Vanessa Jackson from a few episodes ago. She's right. a writer on SNL now. Right. Like I had her on my podcast. We just shot the shit about comedy. She works at SNL. Like, yeah, it doesn't so, get more top of the ladder than that. Right. So it's just like, you just get like people around you. It's like the claw machine from toy story. Just something where you're like, <laughs> Ooh, and then one of your friends yeah. gets picked up into an amazing opportunity. And it's like, I like that. Like uh, Bobby Lee mentioned this, Okay, I'm quoting someone quoting someone else, but a quote he always said he stuck by was Joan Rivers, where she said, like, making it in com- making it is like getting struck by lightning, but you mm. won't get struck by lightning if you're not out in the rain, right? Yeah, so just yeah. keep standing out in the rain. So it's like, it's kind of like that. I just, I just keep doing my projects. I just keep doing my shows and mm-hmm. doing what I can. I'm out in the rain. That's, I think... See, I, I think that I hear what you're saying because I've, it, this is probably also something I've gotten from moving. Mm-hmm. Where, like, I've just recently started kind of learning how stand up and, I, you know, comedy, it's just this, it's almost like this weird, it's like the suitcase you carry with you wherever you go. As, like, right. it's like a, it's a skill. You don't think of it as like a skill as much as it, it really is, where, like, you know, we are learning a craft in a sense. I know that that's like you, a million, you'll listen to whatever podcast and people say that, but like mm-hmm. we are in the sense of like, you know, for the rest of your, I was talking to someone about this, like for the rest of our lives, like if, if we were to quit tomorrow and move to some small town somewhere and like there was like a pub that had shows, you could go there and show up and probably get booked and like comedy still in your life and you like have you're like one of the quality people who do that. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, it's in a, it's a presence in your life that is so like there, it, it, it sticks in you. And I think it's, that maybe seems self-evident to people who don't do comedy, mm-hmm. but there it, it's so uh, separate from the idea of like, Oh, you got to get this, that, and the other. And then it snowballs to this, that, and the other, you start to th- realize it's more of a thing of like, you know, you just get really good at it. And then the idea of getting opportunities on anything is sort of a, in, like that is independent of, of your joke writing and your, right. your own personal projects and stuff. See, I've only ever done, I've like, I used to run a podcast with a friend and I used to uh, host shows in Boston, but mm-hmm. like, I've really only ever been stand up. So right. it's an interesting thing that I'm kind of starting to think about now, now that I've yeah. been here long enough to like not be a stranger. Right. Yeah. I think the, like what you said about the suitcase thing, I think there's also like, um, like there's a stand up comedian mindset of like, if you love something, you should do it as often as possible. Mm -hmm. And also, I think one thing I learned in New York City is if you love something and you want to do it as often as possible and you can't find enough people who are already doing it, Mm -hmm. you just start your own thing and be consistent and people will come. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, like, and, one thing is like in my own comedy career, like I have this podcast, I do my stand up, and then I do like another weekly stream, and I've got my comedy show, right? It's like four things. <clears throat> None of those things are exploding, right, with attention, but all those things are like something that could become something later and are all yeah. part of that like kit of ideas and like that they're all in that suitcase like here's uh, all the different things i can do under the umbrella of comedy and it's yeah. like if one of these takes off my stand-up is just better preparing me for doing more of this totally yeah i i've always wanted to feel more and more in control of, of my stand-up more than yeah. anything you know i remember a friend of mine uh <laughs> he's like He's kind of like a business guy and he he's he try he he does give me good advice about like being a you know your own business which you are as a comedian I guess. Mm. And one time he's like he called me and he's like, "Hey man, I uh, I was just reading about Amy Schumer. Do you know Amy Schumer won last comic standing when she was 2 years into comedy?" And I was like, "Holy shit, no, that's pretty crazy." He goes, "Yeah. Why don't you just do that?" <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Oh, dude, great idea. I never thought about that. You know what? Let me get on there right now. Let me call NBC <laughs> and book myself. Let me get in their Tuesday slot. I was like, 
I you you can't explain it. That that I guess is the part that I you know because the people outside the of uh, comedy will again the people who like we we knew, they know it as David Chappelle's Netflix special that just right. dropped. You know they know it to like the biggest. They know my friends are all like, oh, don't you want to write for SNL? And I'm like, I. I, I obviously I wouldn't say no, but that's not like what I'm thinking to try right. and get. Maybe some, that's probably some people's dreams, but like, you know, I just always wanted to try and get get funnier and then figure it out. And probably mm-hmm. I don't get as much shit as I could because I don't think like that. And that's kind of another mm-hmm. thing that's good about being in New York. But I just think it kind of does eventually work itself out. Like I, I like going on and making everyone feel like, oh, you know what you're doing then like you shouldn't be up there and we know why you're up there. Right. You know, I think uh, you mentioned at the beginning of this being in control of your stand up more. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. Also, like you said, like you want to be just be funnier. And I think that's like a very reasonable goal at this stage in the game is like, I just want to be as good as I can be and not necessarily like I want to work for, I want to be a TV writer right now, or I want to apply for this thing or this other thing. Right. It's yeah. okay to like wanna just get better. And I would say what I have learned in the last two months is start a weekly show. <laughs> Cause giving yourself 10 minutes every week. And if you even if you can get like a small crowd, it's great. It's, great. it's, it's great. better. It's literally better than all the open mics I do that week combined. It's cool, just yeah. like I do a show. It's my own show. I don't have to be perfect, but I just have to make sure the show is fun. I'll do new material. It's fine. Mm-hmm. It's 10 minutes. And like, I, it's great. I, that's a serious thing I recommend to anybody. Yeah. It's really good to have stage time that is not, you, you don't feel like if you mess it up, you'll never get it again. Right. And it's good. First of all, it, it's good stage time. And like, mm-hmm. that is, I think, when you, you lean into the confidence side of things. Right. And when you kind of do like the pocket, you know, like mm-hmm. you, you start to figure out your pocket because the, when you start, like it, it's terrifying. Everyone's everyone books a show and everyone else has been doing it longer than you. And you're like, if I fuck one thing up, like I'm not going to get anything. So once you do start to yeah. get the things and snowballs, you know, the best thing that probably ever happened for my like confidence in my like ability to to like think that I, you know, know that I can think of funny jokes was mm-hmm. I was uh hosting a weekly thing in Boston for these dudes uh who run a bunch of shows in Boston they're called Comedy Party mm-hmm. and they like they took a liking to me and like hey man come work with us help us set up the shows we'll give you stage time and we'll put you on our other shows too and it was great because they were fun ass shows and they were sat- Saturday nights two shows in Boston and it was like that was the first time I'd really had like a regular I had never run a show I had never like really had I, I was friends with a lot of the people who did but I wasn't like th- at any show every week trying to get on and so right. that that was huge that's awesome yeah it was dope it was good and like um, when you first start the idea of like you go through like the idea like going to an open mic is a big deal then you go to a lot of open mics then you're like yeah, hosting yeah, yeah. an open mic that's a huge <laughs> deal right and then the next step up is like I cannot imagine producing a comedy show uh, are you kidding yeah. me so like being involved in that is such such great experience and like you said like they like you they know you're funny they will give you stage time even if you don't bomb and that's okay yeah or even if you bomb a little bit <laughs> people are able to I think people are more uh, uh, understanding of that like on their side it's also just as likely they're going to bomb you know what I mean right like, as long as someone's still a comic and not like they don't get too much Booker head in their in their brain. Right. Although there's a lot of bookers that are just that are not comics and are also really good people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm sure they're out there. Um, no, <laughs> as long as they keep remember, like anyone could have a shitty set for whatever reason. It's not you can't judge someone based on one thing. But you're right. It's always better. To, it feels better to not bomb yeah. every, time. <laughs> every time. Yeah, and yeah, dude. So just, yeah, that was Two Virgins was your first show, right? Uh, no, actually, I I ran a uh, a show with uh, Lee. Um, oh yeah, that wasn't that called. You said that was called objectively awful. No, no, no. <laughs> I just thought I know how that. Was. No, it was uh, it was Little Panda Productions. What we called it. It was just like a park show, mm. and we started just kind of booking our friends and people who came to our open mic, and it was it was tough uh, because it was in Prospect Park, and we would get like some walk by audiences, but it was like it was iffy. But 
there were there were some issues with the show, but I like hosted it and took pictures and carried all the equipment and Lee booked it and like it was a good time. It was a good experience, but I'd say like Two Virgins is my first time truly producing a show like in the like at the command table and like mm. really strategizing and actually getting like audience to like come in, even though we bark for them. Like this right. week we had like two or three people. We were gonna hand them a flyer, be like, hey, comedy show starts at 30 minutes. And they're like, oh, we're going. And we're like, oh, no, you're you're bullshitting us. Take a flyer. And they're like, no, 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 the flyer's on my fridge. We're coming this week. Cool. And I yeah, was like, nice. dude, we are building an audience. So Fuck yeah. that's like the kind like I don't know. It's like the slow but steady thing. And also the format of the show is so easy. Because all I got to do, we got to book people every week. I make a new flyer every week and we bark for it. And mm. then we do the show. I, yeah. it's, it's not overcomplicated. It's nice and smooth. And it's great. It's I love. I also love giving people stage time. Like I talked about this with James Coburn on the show. It's just like when you ask someone like, hey, do you want to do this show? And just their reaction of like, yeah, it's like, it's great. It's like yeah. give and take. It's wonderful. Yeah, it, it feels good. And it's, uh, I mean, dude, you, you're producing a comedy show in the heart of Manhattan, New York City. It doesn't get more, yeah. it doesn't get more prime time than that. You know what I mean? Like if you're as a DIY <laughs> thing. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to, next time I have like four people in the crowd, I'm going to be like, this is prime time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, uh, it's, it's, all worth it because then they'll have 20 people in the crowd because those people kept their flyers on their fridge exactly mm. but yeah it's it's good i think um also the networking aspect of either hosting an open mic or hosting a show mm -hmm. cannot be understated it's like do you want to know what the comedy scene is like go there after a month start an open mic and you will meet everyone you need to meet very rapidly <laughs> yeah yeah, everyone comes and meets. Everyone's grateful for people giving them stage time because, you know, nobody gets into this thinking that they're going to be a producer. If they do, good right. luck, you know, good for them. Nobody gets into this thinking they're going to run a show. And, um, you know, some people are, like, allergic to it, which I get because I'm lazy as fuck. So I totally <laughs> understand why. But everyone's I, – I, like, you know, as someone who comes to the Wobbly Ladder and is, you've, you've given me time on Two Virgins, like, you always appreciate people who give you stage mm. time. And you'd want to like, you know, not fuck up and do well. So it's oh a good two-way street. I'm like a, I'm like a get, I get booked once, twice a month if I'm lucky, like on <laughs> other people's shows, right? It's just like, it's, and I'm friends with tons of people who run show. It's just, mm -hmm. I, I get how it is. Like they got a long list of people to book. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But like, as soon as someone gives me the opportunity, I am like, I will not fail you. I will give it my all. I will yeah. do the bet. Like I'm hosting, uh, I'm hosting drool later this month, uh, for Brittany and Claire. That's a good get. Yeah. Drool's a great show. A great show. Love them. Go check it out. If you're in Williamsburg. Um, I just realized it disappeared from my calendar. So I got to go figure out when that was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they canceled yeah, like, the show. Oh okay. no, I hope not. Uh, yeah. I'm like, hopefully it wasn't last week. I'd die. Um, but yeah, so it's like, Doing like little opportunities like that, it's like I will a thousand percent follow through on this. Like uh -huh. I will like you you have entrusted me with hosting your show that is killing. Like yeah. I will bring it. Like, you know? Yeah. And it's good. It's developing that skill, you know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, it feels like the like it seems like such a jump. But like, is that really that much different than someone saying, like, hey, come host the Oscars? You know what I mean? And yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, but at yeah. the same time, like, you know, just that conceit of like that's on on the macro level versus like the micro level of you right. hosting a great show for people you really want to do well for. Like, you know, it's just the thing of working that skill of stepping up to the plate and, mm -hmm. and doing well. Like that. Right. No matter I feel like being a comedian, regardless of what the stage time is, is just like you're almost like a mercenary at the end of the day where like you're getting <laughs> popped into foreign soil wherever you all around and you just got to get the job done. Like, Oh, like at the height of this, it's like, Oh, I'm going to, uh, this random bar where I have no idea who the clientele are. Well, I just got to get on stage and, and give them some entertaining material for, and then get off. That's it. Yeah, exactly. It's like you, you just, you're always just being like at the end, even the most professional comedians are just being contracted out for entertainment. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, for sure. So I, it's it's an interesting take, and uh, the kinds of opportunities that you end up getting booked for, booked for further on mm-hmm. are like nuts. Like uh, Lee was on a show last summer at the end of the year, and this guy was uh, was on the show. This other comedian, Wally Collins, and. I saw him. He had a really great set. He was a ton of fun. He handled a heckler very well and did the great crowd work and all this. Nice. And then, like, four months later, my company, corporate, has put together, like, the beginning of the year, like, um, sale, uh, like sales kickoff hype up thing. You know, everyone's got to watch it. We're talking about the roadmap for the year, whatever. There's, like, thousands of employees tuning in. And they're like, please welcome our host for the sales kickoff event, yeah. Wally Collins. And I was <laughs> like, he doesn't even work here. <laughs> He's a comedian. I'm like, I, I literally met that guy like three months ago. I was just sitting in the grass and he was on stage. What a small world. That's crazy. I know. It's like, I, I look forward to weird things like that. Like, mm-hmm. I cannot wait until someone offers me like a weird opportunity. You'll get it too. Yeah. It'll come. It's, you're not that far off. It's it's the it's that thing of like, I guess it's imposter syndrome or whatever you call it, where yeah. it's always like it's so much more legit from the outside than from the inside. Yeah. And comedy is no different than if you like work at a restaurant and all the customers think it's like a ship, a well-run ship. And then in the kitchen, there's like fires and people <laughs> hitting each other and shit. Absolutely. So. So I wanted to ask you this. You mentioned you were a creative <laughs> writing major in college. Yes. So. How, what's your comedy writing process like? And do you use any of your creative knowledge, creative writing like strategies for comedy? Um, my writing strategy is very um, unorganized. I'm going to okay. be honest. So okay. I, I, I'm a lot of like free form thoughts. I have like, you know, plenty of notebooks. I have so many notebooks and it's actually weirdly probably not that different than when I first started where it's really just like, you know, I probably have undiagnosed intrusive thought syndrome, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> and like, I'll get just some spinning thought and I'll just write it down or I'll I'll put it in the, the phone. And I actually take a little, I know some people are like incredibly able to t- turn jokes into punch all everything. I take a little while where I'll turn ideas over in my head for like a week, just sort of like, not even like writing anything, just sitting there thinking and trying to arrange something into a way that I think, all right, well, that's something. And then I'll go try it, and then hopefully it, it works. My stuff either works kind of quickly or, like, never works. It's weird. Right. Like, I either, it doesn't, it's not working at all, and I have to, I'll do it for three weeks, and eventually it'll work, or it works right away. And there's never, like, an in-between where, like, it slowly comes along. Like, either, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but um, it, it's a lot of, I guess it's probably kind of close to journaling. Like, I, I guess it's it's mostly... But it's mm. focused a little bit, you know? Like, I have been trying to focus a little bit more on, like, punchline structure yeah. and, like, thinking, at least thinking that, like, looking at something and going, like, okay, this is, like, a premise. Like, where's the, do I think there's a punchline here? If not, how do I get to one? It, right. What do I need for it? You know, and I think that in my head, I still sometimes am writing and thinking, like, imagining the Madison Square Garden special where, like, mm-hmm. everyone's laughing at every, you can't tell. And then I have to remind myself, you know, you're, it's, hey, let's take it down. You're, you're telling this to the grizzly pair. Like you do need to actually have like a structure. <laughs> it does have to be like an actual yeah. joke. Like you got to wake them up and then you can use the punchline. You have to actually know which, yeah, it can't just be like a, a clever rant. Um, right. I, I'm pretty uh, edit focused. I'm, I'm a big believer in like going on and try and, and having something not work for a while and then mm-hmm. kind of figuring out how to shift it maybe. Yeah. Like maybe just trimming things down because maybe you're going on there and you're saying too much and you can distill it with like three or four thoughts. Um, so I guess it's like, it's not writing on stage per se. Cause I don't like think of new shit, but mm. it's definitely like edited on stage for sure, which I guess is every comic, but okay. um, it's, it's really, it's a lot of, uh, and I record all my sets. I very rarely listen to them to be honest with you, because I, I listen if uh, I want to hear reactions or if there was something I didn't plan that I want to hear back. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I record all of them because, you know, there will be times where I'll sit down to to want to to edit something and go, oh, the, actually last week when I did it at, uh, you know, Maxim's mic, it, it 
yeah. got a better. So let me go back and listen to that. So um, a lot of retrospective. I mean, I have, there's all sorts of stuff I've written that I've never said and probably never will. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I kind of, another, again, to, not to bring it back, but like, I really want to figure out how to get to the point where I'm, I'm able to pull off those kind of loftier jokes. You know what I right. mean? Like, I really want to be able to, to figure out how to tell jokes about like, you know, the, the stuff that's, that's more, I guess like the real, you know, I, I guess I'm one of those co- people who love the comedy. That's like, I don't want to say hard hitting. I'm not trying to be Bill Burr, but like, you know, like you're saying something and like, it's, it's funny and it's a commun it's communication. So, right. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And so I think a lot of it is, um, I have to like put myself in a certain mindset, which I only get if I'm on stage and I go like, mm. Oh, that's actually horseshit. And I have to not say that. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. That makes sense. I think, I think it's like the, uh, one thing, uh, like writing on stage for me, it's like, I definitely add material on stage, but mm-hmm. I'll write something down, do it on stage and be like, Oh, uh-huh. this isn't funny enough yet. Uh-huh. And then the pressure is on. It's like disappoint the audience or come up with something really funny on the spot. You know? Yeah. I think that that's kind of nice, which I guess is, um, maybe it's different. You can't obviously do that on like when you have important shows, but like, right. <laughs> when you're out there and you're doing stuff, I will say one thing that I'm a big a proponent of is writing down literally every thought you have, even if you think it's stupid. Like okay. if you're like, Oh, that could be comedy. And you think about it for two seconds. You're like, actually that's dumb. I'll still record like everything I've ever thought comedy wise. I probably have somewhere, whether it's on like a, my phone or like yeah. in my drawer and on a notepad, because I'd rather have it and review it and like have that spark of like, oh yeah, this is why I thought and do it later. Because, right. Because sometimes you do just kind of come back to something and like, I'm actually right now going to be like for the next couple of weeks going to be working on some stuff that I used to, I kind of tried to do an earlier in the summer and put that aside for some other things because I've kind of figured out newer, better ways to say it. So yeah. it's like a wonderful process. Like mm-hmm. you write some stuff down, like, I have a bunch of long phone notes that I, once I finish them, I store them in a Google Drive or a Google mm-hmm. Doc. And every so often when I'm out of ideas or like in a slump, I'll go back and look through that document and see mm-hmm. what kind of half-baked premises do I have? And like, yeah. do I have anything new for them, you know? I think it's a good way to do it. I think that sometimes um, it's, it's addicting to like constantly try new shit. Yeah. But I think that it kind of comes down to like how much stage time you're getting. Like right now right. I'm I'm not I know I don't have as much stage time because I'm here and like things are still coming back and stuff. So like it's a lot of working on stuff. Like I <laughs> I don't need to have as much new material now right. as I might. So it can be a lot of like all right, instead just focus on getting the stuff you have better and have it be right mm. because you know, you're doing a bunch of open mics and a couple shows a month like you said like it's not like you have two shows every night and you need just, you're doing like headlining sets everywhere. You're not, you're not right. preparing the next hour. You are, right. but like there, you don't have a deadline for it. I think that, I think that there's some benefit to the skill of thinking about jokes, um, taking an idea that you really couldn't make work at all and then figuring out how to make it work. I yeah. think that's probably more of an instructive lesson than like, thinking of a new idea that just works better as a raw idea. I think, mm. I think that that is the editing is, I think super important because, you know, I think you ever hear someone who's not a comedian, give you a premise. Cause oh, everyone always, yeah. Yeah. And they're like, you don't understand that. That's like, everyone thinks they can think of, think of premises for stand up comedy. I think that the editing and like identifying what actually is funny is like, yeah. that's the, com- that's what a comic does, you know, like they identify where the funny is. So again, just going back to, I want to get funnier. That's like how I try to think of writing is like, I don't try to hit a page number yeah. limit necessarily. I try to, as much inspiration as I have in a moment, I do try and think of something every day. If I don't, you mm-hmm. know, write a giant thing about it, I'm trying to like turn something over, think of new shit. Do you Even any- if it's, do you have any like premises or jokes that you've like had for a long time that you can't figure out, but you won't let them go? Oh shit. Let me think about, I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> let me think, dude. I don't know. Um, I have so many things that, Oh, well I've been thinking, okay, here's one that I am kind of trying to work on that I actually thought of during pandemic and I've just turned mm-hmm. over in my head. Cause you know, like I've been thinking about like, cause you spend so much time in bars as a stand up, And I love the fact that like, 
bars have these so many whimsical activities like board games and like mm-hmm. you go to a bar and there's like there's like a, a shelf of like Candyland and like and uh sorry and just all these or there's like pinball and i think that that's like millennial energy infecting the bar scene. like that's add yeah. because like our add is stronger than our alcoholism you know what i mean like yeah we can't, can't just, just go sit to a, and drink a beer and you, do nothing exactly you have to like black out and multitask at the same time because it's like you go to a barman for a boomer and it's a barman for a boomer is like a stool and a lamp. There's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and pool then, table if you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And then a bar meant for a, a millennial is like a Toys R Us with a liquor section. It's like so different. <laughs> so like that's, you see, like there's a framework yeah. there and it took me so long to figure out a framework and I'm going to keep trying because I don't know what it is, but I'm, there's something where I'm like, if I could have a joke about that, that like works, that's for some reason, I just love being able to like, I just want to be able to say this. Yeah. And have it be like people like it. And it's, a, I really want insightful jokes, which is probably vanity mm. on my half because I want to yeah. say stuff that makes people go, ah, but I, those are the ones I cling to the most. The ones where, like, if they work, people go, like, ah, that's so true. Those are the ones that I want more. Wow. Those Dude, are, I do not have any fucking jokes <laughs> like that. <laughs> those are the hardest ones to get, honestly. Yeah. I, like, I don't have many of them either. I, they, they're like, they seem like the diamonds in the rough. I love yeah. a great anecdote. I love, like, uh, whatever story, but like, you know, I, I think that fundamentally that's the stand up I really want to get to is I guess I do want to be like a Bill Burr. Like the you say <laughs> something and they're like, God, that's so true. Like, there's right. This, that's like very like Carlin esque. Like, I guess so. Yeah. You know, like George Carlin, everything I watch from him, I never laugh out loud, but mm-hmm. I always nod my head and go, you know, he, he is right. You yeah, know, <laughs> yeah. I know you're just like, man, that's so and it would be, you know, with Carlin, it's great. It's funny because you watch it and like it. I he those specials are so old. There's no way you'd find them funny, just because right. like, you know, the context of humor is is different. The biggest example is like, I don't know. I guess this is like a weird. Um, I feel like Mark Norman, not to you know the non dead one. Okay, he has a few jokes, and because he's all everyone thinks he's structure, 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 but he's got such good like, like his evil brain joke where he talks about like you ever forget your headphones Whew, like i always thought i loved music turns out i just hate my brain and then he goes into like such good yeah. stuff about it like those things that make people go oh shit i think that's just for me that's always been the value of comedy as an art form is like i remember because i remember being a kid like a teenager and like talking with my friends about like you know, like the Louis C.K. like bit mm-hmm. where he says something, it's like, dude, that's so true, or like whatever. Yeah. Pre, you know, the whole thing. But yeah. Um, and I, I that's what I'd love to get to. But it's easier said than done. And but yeah. again, that's to, a hard one. Dude, it's tough. And I think that like to bring it all back around a little bit, like the one of the reasons I wanted to come here is because I think people here are still this is the the trendsetter. I know that the internet is probably the actual trendsetter for comedy now, mm-hmm. but like Stand-up wise, like New York is still the cutting edge, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, so totally. Yeah, there's lots of great other scenes. Boston's a great scene, but I was like, for what I think I want to learn how to do, I think I need to come here. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's like a something that everyone hits at a certain point. You go New York or L.A., and if you want to work on a set, you go to L.A. If you want to be a great stand-up, you come to New York. <laughs> yeah. That's oh yeah, work on a set. That's so true. <clears throat> Dude, and, uh, every LA, every LA comic that ever came to Boston, like, not to shit on LA comic. All right, ninety percent of them used to bomb mm-hmm. so hard because they like, they had like this well choreographed like thing, mm-hmm. and like like they'd flail around the stage for like <laughs> like twenty minutes, and they were like, "Why doesn't anyone appreciate this performance?" And someone named Sully would like call them a of a, a fairy or something because <laughs> they they didn't they weren't saying anything, you know. That's not just shit on LA comics. It's just such a different vibe. Yeah, it's it's completely different. Like a lot of, I've had a lot of friends go to LA, do comedy, report back, and be like, it's a lot of people who want to be actors, mm. who want to get their name out there by also being comedians. So there's yeah. a lot of character work. There's a lot of like stuff that we wouldn't consider stand up. Stand up. I know it's they want to be entertainers. Like right. they want to be, they're almost like uh, neo vaudeville performers where they just right. want to like do all of it. Like whatever like niche they can fill, that's the best. Is, is right. Like, yeah, I know. I I remember the first time I heard people at stand ups be like, "Oh yeah, I want to be an actor. I'm doing this. Help me with my acting." I'm like, "You think this helps with your acting? <laughs> how, how do you think this helps with your acting?" 
watching right. a bunch of people stare at you while you talk and they don't say anything. I guess that does kind of help with acting. I think it's just like putting yourself <laughs> out there and just bombing mercilessly. Yeah. And just being like, I can, I can go up from here, you know? True. True. I don't know though. I, I think it's really interesting what you said about like insightful humor. Cause it's like, like a joke that I'm working on that I can never figure out how to put into like proper joke form is about like how, um, I walked past a bike with a plastic baby seat on it and it had like individual leg slots for the baby's legs. And I was thinking who reviews baby stuff, you know, because <laughs> babies sure. don't really have the articulation or thought processes necessary <laughs> yeah. to fully review a product meant for babies. This leads me to the conclusion that somewhere in the world, there is a baby sized man who is reviewing <laughs> these products for the other babies. Yeah, yeah. And this joke, this premise, I have been working on this probably, I tried it for like four months, like a year and a half ago. And then just last week, Lee goes, you should, you should work on baby sized man. And I'm like, that's my white whale. I'm not saying anything. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, the most important joke to me right now is a joke that you will gleam no insight from. <laughs> I know. But see, that is funny because I've never thought about that. But you're right. How do they know what babies like? Right. Do like, how do I they mean? know the babies are like, yeah, this That's, is comfortable. Yeah, you know? I do. Li I do like that. Baby size. What do you so do you think there's like boss baby out there somewhere? Who's yeah, like kind of like, kind of same <laughs> idea. I, I guess I didn't think about boss baby until you mentioned it just now. But like. Like a guy who's like, you know, I feel like you put me in this jacket. I kind of feel a cry coming on. I think yeah. the other babies are going to hate this, you know? That's funny. And yeah, he's, that's... Making, he's making racks. Yeah. Like, you go to his solid gold penthouse. Mm. You mm. bring the baby car carrier you want him to try. You yeah, open right. up a briefcase full of cash. He nods. He climbs in your product. Mm -hmm. Then he tells uh, you what he thinks. Like a baby, a baby think tank, pretty much. Like a baby think tank. But yeah. there's only one guy, and he is... He's like kind of a mogul. He's kind of a big deal. I, so. I can see why you would want to make that work. That's because I see you've got like the, I feel like it's, so you go, okay, this is like something. What do I need to say or how, what, like what scenario do I need to present here right. for people to understand why this concept is funny? Right. Like, and it, that's it's the like language the, of stand up to The me. ridiculousness of a baby sized man doing adult and baby things. It's mm -hmm. like, there's so much about this that I wish I could compress into yeah. like a one and a half minute joke. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I have no idea how. And I just think about it all the time is like, what else could the baby size man do? <laughs> I think I, I think the thing when you do that too is when you go up and you say a story and it bombs, it might just be that that story's not funny. But I feel like right. when you go up and you say a joke like that and it bombs. Mm hmm. I think that it actually it helps because it actually helps shape your sense of humor. Like, right. It's almost like um, like you start to understand a certain type of grammar with like, OK, I think this is you're really putting out there what you think is funny in a way. Right. That, like here, I'll give you another example, which I had to stop doing because it wasn't. So I was trying to figure out a way to talk about, you know, my grandmother's in her. I might have said this at your, your mic recently. Mm -hmm. My grandmother's in her 90s and she's still all with it. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, that's such a great thing. And I'm like, you know, she's still like, she's still present. And I'm like, yeah. But then again, she's present for the life of a 90 year old woman. Right. Like, <laughs> like, I don't think she wants to be completely all there. I think she wants a little bit of dementia. Right. Like, just enough that for the occasional vacation. And like, I, I don't know how to say it. That's like kind of too heavy. So I need to right. like back off because I've been saying it and like, it's not really been working. And I've been like, all right, I need to put this one on the back burner until I can figure out a more palatable form of of saying this, I think. Right. It is like that challenge also when you say something and you're trying to... You have something funny to say, but you have to say it in such a way that the audience doesn't immediately recoil from like yeah. some aspect of it that's necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's challenging. I remember Brian Regan. This is And this is a different, but like Brian Regan once being like... Um, yeah, you know, it sucks because, like, there's a lot of comics who, I forget who he was talking to, but he was like, comics will go up, and if they're, if they're short or joke people and something doesn't work, like, it's fine because they can hopefully follow up with something that'll get the crowd next. He's like, I'm a bits guy. Like, 
if what I'm doing isn't working, that crowd's on board for five more minutes. Like, <laughs> like if they if they're not into the premise or they don't get it, I, I've written a I, I've got a thing that I'm yeah. saying all this and then and he's like, so it's like when I bomb, which by the way, I don't know if that guy actually bombs everyone. He's like everyone's favorite guy ever, but like. <laughs> he he was like when i bomb it is a prolonged process oh my god and i was just like i'm sure that sucks but there's also something to that of like you know the flip side is when it works he's got five minutes of oh my god brian regan's bit on uh trains or whatever you know yeah so, <laughs> interesting so that's why i bomb so hard <laughs> <laughs> you're you're writing too much maxim that's why <laughs> yeah i write i write so much <laughs> you write too much actually too much yeah not the other way sometimes so. i'm jealous of uh like alex Tauben, who just like throws yeah, out yeah, the yeah. one-liners or like benny feldman it's just like one-liner 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 bombs do another one-liner it works yeah he's great and he resets the the character so much that like mm -hmm. he can get back into it him he's great i mean dan wicks i feel like really good oh, punch oh yeah too um there's a lot of i i gotta say the the not that again boston is like that but the quality of open mic comedian here is really high like yeah it's there's a lot of real good guys here who are just such good writers they're like think of such clever shit and like it's pretty sweet to like just be able to be right. It definitely helps you raise your game. Yeah, because absolutely. It, yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a great feeling, man. I when I know, first I'm, got here, I bombed for like two months straight. Yeah, and every time I bombed, it's like I could feel myself getting better because I was weeding out things that would work other places but weren't as strong as they could be here in the city. You know, mm -hmm. that's a good way to go about it. Because it doesn't go two ways, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, like the stuff that works on the, you know, the middle of nowhere, unfortunately, doesn't really. Although you also can't bring your like your G, your subway bits to, you know, Kennebunkport, Maine. Yeah, I brought a I brought uh, I told Ratfuck Alley in Chicago <laughs> on Joe's show. And it worked. It worked. I was oh, it like, did work. I was like, I shouldn't, nice. I shouldn't have tried it, but I did, and it worked. And you know it, what? It pulled it off. But see, this is why we do this. Now you get to break that down and go. Here's why it worked. I think that mm -hmm. not to get all it's your material, but I feel like that would work in Chicago because Chicago's not a better city than New York. It's just yeah. as like gross. <laughs> yeah. And they have just as many like crusty old people who would be like, oh, you know what this city used to be that. Yeah. Like I think so. And then it's like uh, that's again that you've what you've done comedy long enough you just recognize what'll work where you'll know if this is a certain type of city with a certain type of crusty old person like they'll get this they yeah. New York is not the barrier here there's other ways right. for them to empathize with this yeah and that's dude that's that's comedy I think like that's the language man that's that's what I'm trying to get you know it's like the puzzle you got to solve the puzzle for every new place yeah. I know. I'm making it seem like I'm so much better at this than I am. Like, <laughs> or like I'm so much more thoughtful about this than I am. I cut to my notebook, which is over there with like a joke about my French roommates. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shit. So we're actually, we're down to our last like five ish minutes here. Okay. Um, and I asked this question at the end. You've probably Thank heard God. it. Thank God. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so in your, I asked this to everybody, as you probably know, but in your comedy journey, Yes. Do you have a theme or a message that you stick to within yourself? Mm. Not necessarily like like to keep yourself motivated, not necessarily in the work you create, but something that like when you wake up in the morning for a day of comedy, what's your like motivator? Yeah, okay. So I think that the thing that I remind myself of is just like if you had told me um like the things that I'd done, which it's not like I've hosted SNL, but the way the places that I've gotten to and gotten to do with comedy and the compliments I've received from people who I think are super legit. If you told me I'd gotten all those things one or two or three years ago, it would have seemed crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, so not to do a huge detour, but I used to do bands in high mm -hmm. school and college. And I remember like a couple years into being a band, I was talking with one of my bandmates who was one of my good friends. And I was like, dude, remember when we were just like shithead kids who used to just sit around and do nothing? Would you imagine if you told those kids like we are now you're in a band and you get to like travel around Massachusetts and play like shows with people you don't know? And comedy feels the same to me where I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, if you told yourself you you've you've gotten to the places where you've gotten, you know, before you started, you'd be like, that's crazy. And I don't think that threshold really ever necessarily stops i think like right think about like when you you step back if i do the six months of 
man, from where I was when I first got here to like where I am now, I'm in such a, I know people, people, I, I've gotten better jokes. I've like mm-hmm. learned my way around. I've like, I've adapted and grown and become more capable. So when you extrapolate to another six months, there's no reason to freak out. You know, the trajectory yeah. has still been good. And I think that's the only thing because the day to day fucking sucks. Like yeah. <laughs> the day to day of like going two weeks of nothing you're doing is, is working or like you get bum open mics where nobody shows up or like the show you were on gets canceled due to uh, rain. <laughs> There's mm, literally yeah. now it's rain. <laughs> you're getting bumped by the weather now in post COVID days. <laughs> but like the, the thing of going like, yeah, man, just keep it all in perspective. You're not at old. People start doing this shit in their forties and become mm-hmm. great at it. Like, right. Don't put the age thing on it. Like just take care of your other stuff and try and do as much of it as you can. And there's always like, there's only more to grow into it. You know, there's only better things to do with it. I think is the, you know, Mm -hmm. like there's no sliding backwards as long as you are mindful. I think that's the best way that I can think. That's a great way to put it. I think also it's like over time you, you have that thing where you're always getting better and improving that like passive improvement, you know, we were talking about. And with that, you also get more, you get your your level of adventure increases. You get more opportunities. You encounter yeah. weirder stuff. Meet new people. It's all like it's all fun down the road, dude. It's there's nothing still more fun than just like going to a show and everyone has a good time and you just like hang out and have a drink and just talk shit afterwards. Mm-hmm. And it's even better. I'm one of the weirdos who likes the road. Like I love traveling to go because New York uh, in New England you drive like three hours to do a show. And it's just fucking a ton of fun, Damn. unless the show is awful. But otherwise, I'm, it's just. I'm good trying to stuff. get. Uh, I'm trying to get Ben Moore on here because he's been doing comedy for 14 years, mm. and he's been on the road for eight of them. And I uh, want to. I want to talk to him about that. <laughs> please do. I'll totally listen. I'd love to hear those stories. So we'll that'd see about sick. that because that'd be crazy. But mm. I couldn't do the road. I mean, I can do a little bit of a road. Probably like I could do like a tour. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I couldn't do it all the time. You can go to Chicago. That's... Yeah, I can go to Chicago <laughs> on a business trip and then hit someone up and then get on a show during one night mm-hmm. of that business trip. Mm-hmm. So and in a, a one year, stop tour. Yeah, in a year. <laughs> in a year you'll be getting two shows on that business trip. Yeah. And uh let's see, next year I'll be going to Vegas for a training event. So maybe oh, I can yeah. get away from everybody and see what's going on down there. But yeah, nice, <laughs> nice. And that'll be the big break, Maxim. Big break. They'll they'll see me. <laughs> they'll be like, This is our next show girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. This is an awesome episode. Dude, thanks. For, I appreciate it. This was a great talk. I'm happy to come on. Yeah. Uh, where can the people uh, find you? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at, at Jeff Medoff. It's spelled M E D O F F. It's like Madoff, but medicine. So Med- Jeff Medoff. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Medoff My Lawn. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much it. I'm going to start trying to figure out putting more stuff out there. I might create like a TikTok and put some stand up clips and all that. So just check out those and I'll post shit on there nice yeah awesome yeah thanks again for doing this this was great um listeners if you listened all the way through jeff's episode uh maybe go check out another one too there's a lot of great people in here uh we've had a lot of comedy episodes in a row uh hopefully i will break that streak uh next week but we'll see um (laughs) thanks again for coming on jeff and i'll talk to you later bye